Good morning, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. I have a mm -hmm. question, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Should a pastor have a nine-to-five job? In the uh, Bible, there is a scripture, and I don't know where to find it right now, uh, saying something to the effect that if a man don't work, he don't eat, I'll take my answer off the uh, phone and take it on the well, radio. Well, well don't, don't hang up yet, because I'm not sure what you mean by a nine-to-five job. Do you mean... Should a pastor hold another job besides the pastoral job? Yes. Okay. I'll be glad time. to talk to you. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll be glad to address it. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Steve. Okay. All right. Well, pastoral work is work. When the Bible says, he that will not work, let him not eat, it definitely is saying that a person who's too lazy to do anything productive to make, to make his time worthwhile, uh, he should not be sponsored. He should not be, um, a man who's lazy should not be encouraged in his laziness. We shouldn't be enabling somebody in a life of uh, unproductiveness. And there, that's what Paul is saying in Second Thessalonians. There's quite a few places where Paul talks about this kind of thing, but it's Second Thessalonians chapter 3, where he says, if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. Uh, the pastoral job, or work, is a work. I, I don't like to call it a job, uh, because a job seems like something you do just for the money. I mean, most people have jobs only because they need the money, and if it wasn't for the money, they wouldn't do the job. But a pastor is a man, hopefully, who would serve God, regardless whether he was paid. However, he needs to be paid, in many cases, to pay his bills. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that um, every pastor has to receive support from the church. If, he's, if his pastoral work is such that he doesn't have to work full-time in the ministry, then he can take a job on the side. Lots of pastors have taken regular jobs on the side if their pastoral work did not require their full-time attention. However, there are many churches that put so much work on the pastor that he would it'd be impossible for him to hold another job uh, in addition to doing the pastoral work. You see, doing pastoral work is working, just like, let's say, being a college professor is working. You might say, well, the pastor, all he does is talk. Well, lots of people talk for a living. Uh, school teachers talk for a living. Uh, college professors talk for a living. Lots of people uh, talk for a living. Uh, just because they're not out there sweating in the, in the sun, uh, you know, breaking rocks with, with sledgehammers or something like that, doesn't mean they're not working. There's all kinds of work. Lots of people work in air-conditioned offices uh, in secular jobs. Um, and, you know, that, that doesn't mean they're not working. Uh, so there's all kinds of work to do. A pastor has a lot of work to do. Most of it is not physical labor, although sometimes pastors get strapped with a lot of that too. But the pastor's work, if he's doing it well, is worthy of support. Paul said the elders who rule well should be accounted worthy of double honor. And Paul means by that honorarium. He means support, financial support. He said especially those who labor in the word and in teaching. So Paul considered that laboring in the word and in teaching was a labor that entitled a person to be supported. And Paul said he himself, although he did work at a job making tents, he said he could do that because, you know, as a single man, he, had, he didn't have family responsibilities, so he could preach full-time and work full-time. He could work two shifts, one making a living and one preaching. Most pastors are married men with families, and they, you can't expect them to put in, you know, 40 hours or more in church work and then 40 hours or more in another job. So you need to appreciate the fact that what a pastor's doing, if he's doing his work well, the Bible says, uh, he should be supported for it. And Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica in chapter 5, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, he said, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and who admonish you, that be your preachers, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. that They're doing a work. And so when Paul said whoever doesn't work should not eat, he didn't mean that uh, preachers had to go out and do another kind of work in addition to the work they're doing. Now, I myself worked full-time or part-time in jobs to support myself for the first 12 years. I was in the ministry. Uh, after that, I had to run a school, which was a full-time proposition. I didn't charge for it because I don't believe in charging for the ministry, but I did work full-time in it. And I just had to trust God to provide, which he did. 
but I, I didn't have time after that. When I started running a Bible college, I didn't have time to uh, hold another job on the side. So uh, I, I worked as a volunteer, but it was full-time, and it was work, lots of work, more than 40 hours a week. So I guess what Paul says is you need to recognize those who labor among you and appreciate them for, and uh, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And that would include their support. Paul said in First Timothy chapter 5 that those who... Uh, let, let me turn there here. For some reason, the actual words are... I need to look at them here. Uh, I did mention in, in chapter 5 of First Timothy 17, the elders who rule well should be kind of worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. But it also says in First Timothy... Uh, no, in Galatians chapter 6... Um, and verse 6, that those who are taught in the Word should share, and Paul means in tangible ways, with those who teach them in the Word. Uh, because Paul said that if he is, for example, providing spiritual benefit to people, then for them to meet his financial needs would not be a, uh, you know, a rip-off for them. They're getting better out of the deal than he's getting. If they give him money and he gives them spiritual food, they're the winners, not him. Uh, he's only getting money. They're getting something of eternal value. So the support of ministers is definitely taught in Scripture. And I appreciate your call about that. Another Ben from Dexter, Oregon. You've been waiting next longest. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Uh, Hi. I was reading in uh, Genesis, and uh, I don't know, it just kind of struck me a little bit when uh, when God told Adam and Eve that the penalty for their disobedience would be death. And it just seems like there's kind of a theme throughout the Old Testament of God warning his people, um, you know, when, when disaster is going to come, like a, a temporal thing, you know, against nations coming against them and stuff. And uh, I guess the question that I have is, uh, where does the idea of hell fit into the Old Testament? Um, and well, does it seem a little yeah, weird that God would have such a severe penalty and not say anything about it? That is one of the considerations that has led many to question whether the traditional doctrine of hell is really what the Bible teaches. There are those who teach uh, a doctrine called uh, conditional immortality. Uh, it's also known as annihilationism. And they would point out the very thing you pointed out, that when God warned Adam and Eve that you know, if they sin, there will be a penalty. He didn't say, and your penalty will be that you will consciously be tormented in flames for all eternity. Now, if that is the case, it would have been generous of him to let them know. That would be, it'd be a nice thing to be warned about. But instead, he said, the day you eat of it, you will die. And, uh, of course, some people say, well, death is uh, you know, a euphemism for hell. Well, maybe it is, but if it is, God sure didn't let that be known. And, and that's the point. Uh, you know, if, if I'm warning my children, don't do such and such a thing or else you're going to be you're going to receive such and such a penalty. If the penalty, if I say you will receive a slap on the wrist, but in fact, I'm going to cut their arm off. Uh, I, I would have been a, a more generous dad to let them know what the full weight of the penalty was instead of letting them think something much less. And. And so, you know, every time the Bible talks about the, the punishment that is owed to the sinner, it always says it's death. And this is true both in the Old and the New Testament. You know, in Ezekiel, it says in chapter 18, the soul that sins shall die. It doesn't say the soul that sins shall live forever and ever and ever and ever and wish they could die because they're in such torment. It says they will die. It doesn't, it doesn't elaborate any further. There's no place in the Bible, or I should say there's no place in the Old Testament, that speaks about or gives any information about the, the state of the dead after they've died. So, you know, there's no description of heaven or hell in the Old Testament. So, you know, certainly for 4,000 years of Old Testament history, the people who were familiar with what God was revealing would have felt that if they sin, the penalty is death. They had no reason to believe otherwise. In fact, that's well, what, what God told them. What was the idea of the, of the judgment in the Old Testament? I mean, I know that some, I mean, there's a lot of places where it talks about God judging. Uh, how would they have understand, uh, understood that if they didn't have an idea of, of an afterlife uh, firmly cemented? 
Well, uh, you know, it's hard to know what they thought the judgment would be after death if they even believed there would be one. Uh, we, we find that when the Old Testament talks about judgment, uh, for example, take Deuteronomy 28, where it talks about what the rewards for righteousness and faithfulness are and what the penalties for unfaithfulness to God are, uh, the rewards are you'll, you'll have a lot of children, you'll live long, you'll have a secure land that's not invaded by your enemies, you'll have a, a, a lot of crops and prosperity. And then, of course, if you're wicked and if you violate God's covenant, well, then uh, your, your wombs will miscarry your babies, your cattle will miscarry their offspring, uh, your crops will be nothing, you know, there won't be any rain, uh, you'll, you'll be driven out of your land by invaders and so forth. In other words... The judgments, the only judgments that the Old Testament really describes at all, have to do with things that would happen to them in this world and in this life. Now, there's no reference in the Old Testament to uh, particulars of any kind of judgment or, or blessing after death. Now, in the New Testament, Paul says in, in, in 1 Timothy that God or Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That means immortality is something that God has brought into, uh, into the light, where we can see it in the New Testament. It was not visible in the Old Testament. It was not mentioned. It was not talked about. So there were 4,000 years where God was communicating with people, but he didn't tell them anything about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in, in the New Testament, uh, there are references to judgment, which many will take to be post-mortem judgment, you know, judgment in the next life which uh, some of the passages certainly are talking about that, but not all of them necessarily. But I think whenever we read about judgment in the New Testament, we might assume it's talking about hell. But in the context, that's not always the case. Sometimes it probably is. But uh, still, when you read about hell in the New Testament, sometimes you read words like uh, they'll be uh, you know, consumed in the fire or they'll face everlasting destruction. Or something like that, you know, destruction, consumed, per perishing. You know, John 3.16 says, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. It sounds like the two options are, if you do believe in him, you will live forever. But if you don't believe in him, you won't. You'll perish. You know, you'll have everlasting life if you believe, otherwise you'll perish. So there are many, there are many uh, evangelical scholars today uh, who have considered that maybe the, the traditional doctrine of endless torment is not what the Bible really teaches. Now, there are a, about three or four verses in the whole Bible that might encourage the view of eternal torment. But, uh, but those are mostly found in, uh, in, para in a parable of the, of the sheep and the goats, in one case, and also, right. in, the, also in the book of Revelation, which is uh, written as a series of symbolic visions, it's hard to know exactly how literal to take some of the things in there, or in the parables, for that matter. But uh, in terms of the, the repeated references in Scripture of the judgment of the wicked, death, perishing, being destroyed, being consumed, much, much, much more common. In fact, uh, hundreds of times. Well, I don't know if I should say hundreds of times. Scores of times, anyway. As opposed to three or four times. Uh, statements being made that lead to the conclusion that, they're, you know, that people actually live forever in torment. Well, I know that you've done a lot of study on uh, the different views of hell and, and stuff, and uh, I guess I was just really concerned with, with um, I don't know, just reading Genesis and how God's reputation being kind of tarnished by him uh, not revealing that. I was kind of thinking, oh, right. what, what would well, he say about that? I mean, what would the traditional um, the tr traditionalists say about, about God... Uh, Almost well, yeah, when, uh, when I was a traditionalist, that is, when I, when I believed in the traditional doctrine of hell and had no doubts about it, which was through most of my adult life and ministry, uh, right. if someone said, well, what's, this, what's up with God saying you'll surely die? Uh, uh -huh. Why does he say that instead of talking about hell? I would have said one of two things. I would have said, uh, on the one hand, death is separation from God. Death is not simply the cessation of biological life. Death is separation from God. And therefore, what he's saying is they'll be separated from God. And uh, however long that may last, he does not say, but it, but it does not rule out the possibility of it being for eternity. Now, it, since those days, I've come to question whether I have any biblical basis, or for that matter, any etymological basis, 
for saying that death means separation from God. It was a theological statement, but I don't know if it's a statement that has any bearing from the Greek, Hebrew, or English language. So uh, it doesn't account for torture or anything like that. Right, exactly. Uh, and then the other thing I would have said is that God is not obligated to tell us what the full penalty of our misdeeds are. He tells us not to do them. And, uh, you know, if, if he doesn't tell us all the penalties, that's, then we're just taking our risks when we know we're not supposed to do something. We don't know what the full penalty is, but we're going to take our chances anyway. Well, snooze, you lose. You know, you think you, think you know, and you find out it's a lot worse than you thought it was going to be. But, but God didn't owe it to you to, to lay out the total penalty. Now, my problem with that argument right now is that if God had said nothing about penalties, this might be so. If God had simply said, don't sin or you'll be sorry, you know, then that could leave open any, any number of penalties, that could, that, including eternal torment. You never know what, how sorry you're going to be or what it is that's going to make you sorry. But if God specifically says, if you sin, you're going to die, then, uh, and, and no explanation beyond that, then there's no reason for Adam and Eve or anyone else in the Old Testament to think die means stay alive and suffer forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Because die is a word that, in normal usage, has the opposite meaning. It means you don't stay alive. Right. And not only that, but you just read the prophets, and God goes into so much detail as far as judgments that he's going to bring and warns them over and over. I mean, there's no guessing at what he's going to do. I mean, not that he was obligated to do that. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. When When he's describing the temporal judgments on nations... He's, uh, he doesn't spare words. He doesn't spare details. You know, he gives many, many details. How much more important would it be for him to tell the details of eternal torment, if that's a true doctrine? Right. Yeah. Well, those well, are, those are some of the, just... yeah, those are some of, the, some of the considerations that have moved a lot of evangelical scholars to question whether the traditional doctrine really is what the Bible teaches or whether it's just something that the Catholic Church, you know, pretty much came up with to keep people in line. Uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of people now think. A lot of people think that the traditional doctrine of eternal torment is an invention or, or at least something that the Catholic Church used uh, for political reasons and that the Bible itself really doesn't give much support to the idea of eternal torment. None at all in the Old Testament and very, very few verses that could be used to support it in the New Testament. And even those verses in the New Testament that could be used to support it are quite legitimately capable of being understood in a different way. It's just that most Christians have never considered, you know, the matter critically. Well, I never, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't have a problem saying, I don't know what's going to happen in the afterlife, and I'm fine with that. Yeah. But I do have a problem with sharing a view that actually would impugn the character of God, and that, that's where I'm kind of getting nervous about. The, right. And you know, as, as you may know, if you've listened to me enough, uh, you, you know that I do not have a specific view of what right. the ultimate penalty is. I mean, I do know there's a hell. I, there's, I know there's a lake of fire. And the mm-hmm. wicked who are unsaved will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's a very nasty fate. Now, whether they're burned up there quickly, burned up there instantly, whether they, um, whether they are tortured there for a while and then they burn up, or whether they last forever there, uh, you know, those are different options. Right. And some people, and, and there's also a view out there held by many evangelicals, and, have, and it was once the majority view of the church, to our surprise, when we study church history, the majority view of the church in the 5th and 6th centuries was that hell is a place of purging. That when people go to hell, it's, uh, it's not just punishment. It's for redemption. It's to redeem them, bring them to repentance. Uh, just as our fiery trials in this life may be used of God to bring us to repentance, some people believe that the fires of hell are to bring people to repentance who have failed to come to repentance through the lesser trials of this life. So, anyway, there's, there are these different views. And, and while this last view I mentioned sounds to some people a lot like the Catholic view of purgatory, uh, it's not the same as purgatory. Uh, but it is a view that was held bef- uh, before the Roman Catholic Church became the Roman Catholic Church. It, it, was, held, it was held in the, uh, the Alexandrian Church. It was held in the Church of the East by the, the main leaders. And uh, it is, you know, if we were not Western Christians, if we were Eastern or African Christians, uh, we would not be so unfamiliar with alternate views of hell. 
You see what happened? <clears throat> you may have heard me say this before, but in the 4th century, there were six schools of Christianity in the Mediterranean world. And uh, four of them taught that hell is the place where sinners are brought to repentance and redeemed. One of them, the one in Ephesus, taught that they are uh, annihilated, you know, that they're just burned up in hell. And one of the six schools taught that there's eternal torment in hell, and that was the, the school in Rome. So uh, what you may know is after that time, after the 4th century, the Roman church became dominant in the West, and all the Western churches came under the bishop of Rome. And so the doctrines of Rome became the doctrines of the church in the West. However, the Eastern church was never under the Pope, and the Church of the East uh, did not uh, come under that doctrine, uh, and the Church of Antioch did not either initially. Uh, took a long time. So anyway... The, the point here is that the majority of Christians at one time did not accept the view that is the only one we've ever heard. And, and the, it may be that the one we've heard is the only one we've heard because we're Western Christians. The Reformation happened in Catholic Western Europe. There, nev there never was a Reformation in the Church of the East or in, in the African Church, but there was in the Western Church. So most of us are either Roman Catholic or Protestant, which means products of Roman theology. And uh, so there, uh, it, is, it is worthwhile to raise questions about whether the traditional theology we've been taught is really what the Bible teaches. If Luther hadn't raised that question, we'd all be Catholics today. Uh, he just raised a question about other Catholic doctrines, not the ones about hell. Anyway, Ben, I've got someone who's been waiting over a half hour to talk, and we've got other calls waiting. I have to run. Thank you so much. Okay, good talking to you. Thanks for your call. All right, let's talk to Bill from Nebraska. Bill, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, sure. I was raised in a Baptist church all my life, and I'm, I'm 59 years old. But um, I seen this guy witnessing at a gas station. He's been bringing me to his church, and I you ever heard of? Um, and I know what's wrong, but he thinks he needed. Uh, I can't even pronounce the, the name. He said that Jesus has a mother, and it's and it's um, Am Sung Hong or something from Korea. Have you heard about that? Well, no, but there's a lot of cults that have come out of Korea. Was this yeah, a Korean no, man? not a true. He's saying that they changed the name of Jesus, so I don't really have to call you. I just wanted a few new information about it. I've been going to their Bible studies, and I need to quit going because yes, I you don't do. believe... Uh, now, are they, saying, are they saying that there's a living woman in Korea who's Jesus' mother? Is that what they're saying? Jesus' wife, yeah. Oh, his wife. Okay. Uh, and he said Jesus came back, and they say Jesus came back in uh, 1948, and the second coming of Jesus. Okay. Is so why why are you why are you studying with these people, Bill? Well, that's a good question. I'm uh, I called them tonight and told them uh, um, I'm not going to tell you no more with them, but I just wanted yeah. To Jesus Jesus time. said if they say to you, look, he's here in the wilderness, or no, he's over here. He says, don't go out there. Don't go check on them. It's, they're just yeah. deceiving. Yeah. So, so I would just say stay far from them. They're just a cult. And there's lots of cults that have come out of Korea. That's yes, part, partly, because, partly because the Christian movement grew so rapidly in Korea in the 80s. Uh, you know, the four biggest churches in the world were in Korea uh, at one time. And, okay. uh, and, and where there's a lot of Christians, there's also a lot of uh, splinter groups off of mainstream Christianity, and, and these, some of them are very bizarre, and and yeah, I've, I've heard some, I've heard several and that's bizarre cults. in the Bible. There'll be false teachers, false yes. religions, you know. Yes, false teachers uh, and false Christ and so forth. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. beware. Well, okay. Well, um, yeah, I will. I won't. I won't even go to that church no more. And I, God bless you. And uh, you sound like you know the Bible real good. And I appreciate your services. Well, thank you, Bill. Good to hear from you in Nebraska. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye now. I only have a um, about a minute before we're going to have to take a break at the bottom of the hour. We have some of our stations leave the network at the half-hour point. The program goes on for an hour. That is another half-hour. And if you are listening to a station that actually leaves the network at this point, you can hear the second half of the program by going to our website, thenarrowpath.com, where we stream the program live and we archive it for later. There's also a podcast, and there's also our Internet, uh, our, our telephone apps, uh, which you can listen to the program 
all the way through on those apps. And they are free, so you might want to check those out. The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry, and uh, we, we pay for the radio time. We buy the time on the radio. There's no one paid at the Narrow Path. I'm a volunteer. Everyone's a volunteer. Uh, we got a lot of people who volunteer, but nobody gets paid a penny, and no one receives any benefits. But we do take the money that is given, and we give it to radio stations so that we can stay on the air, and that's what we do. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to the Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. You can also donate, if you want to, from our website, thenarrowpath.com. But thenarrowpath.com is a resource for you to take things for free. Everything is free there. Or you can donate at thenarrowpath.com. Please stay tuned. In about 30 seconds, we will be right back to continue the program for the second half hour. You are listening to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. The Narrow Path is listener-supported radio. After the show, we invite you to visit thenarrowpath.com to learn more. There are topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and the radio archives of all our shows. So when the show is over, come on over to thenarrowpath.com. Learn, study, enjoy. We thank you for your support, and we thank you for listening each day to The Narrow Path. We now return you to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve is not in the studio today, so calls from listeners will not be taken. In place of the usual format, we have put together some of the best calls from past programs. They cover a variety of topics important to anyone interested in the Bible and Christianity. And now, please enjoy this special collection of calls to The Narrow Path. Let's talk to another caller. This is going to be Paul from San Diego. Paul, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. I lost connection with you yesterday, but uh, I'm still in agreement with you, but I got, I'm going to shoot another one at you. Uh, your view, please, on uh, 144,000 in Revelation. Well, it seems like you've got a lot of questions about Revelation, don't you? Are you studying Revelation right now, or are you just fascinated with that subject? Well, I, I study everything up in, in the Bible for 35 years. Yeah. And, sure. you know, you're, well, you're, you're the only one that I find that agrees with the things that I've seen in the Bible and, every, you know, all these other stuff. But I don't see it, you know? So, yeah. Uh, well, if you keep asking, you'll probably find something you don't agree with me about. But let me yeah. tell you what I think in answer to your question. What do I think about the 144,000? I think they are the faithful remnant of the Jews uh, who came to Christ before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, my reason for believing that is that I believe that much of Revelation is describing the judgment of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And Revelation 7 describes God as sealing these people for protection before he brought that judgment. Before the wind blows on the sea or the land or anything or any tree, God seals his servants on their forehead to identify them. And then when the judgment is poured out, they are immune to it. Now, this imagery that we find in Revelation 7 is borrowed from Ezekiel 9. In Ezekiel 9, Jerusalem was about to be destroyed by the Babylonians. And Ezekiel saw a vision of God sending out an angel to put a mark or a seal on the forehead of all of God's servants in Jerusalem to preserve them from that judgment that was coming from the Babylonians. Now, in John's day, I believe there was a judgment coming from the Romans. It was almost the... It was like a replay of what happened in 586 B.C. What happened in 70 A.D. from the Romans is exactly what happened in 586 B.C. from the Babylonians. And so much of the language of Ezekiel is picked up again in in Revelation. And this idea of God sealing his servants, the remnant in Israel, uh, for safety against that judgment is used both in Ezekiel 9 and in Revelation 7. Now, Revelation 7 says there's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, which I think simply means there's a significant large number from the whole of the nation of Israel. In chapter 14 of Revelation, it says that they are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, the first fruits of the church were the Jewish people in Jerusalem who were saved when Peter preached on Pentecost and when the apostles were ministering there. Almost all the early Christians, for the first many thousands, maybe many tens of thousands, were Jewish before the Gentiles started coming into the church. And so the Jewish converts were the first fruits of the church. And that's what it says about these people 
in Revelation 14, I think it's around verse 4 or 5, it says they are first fruits unto God. James, in James chapter 1, is writing to Jewish Christians in his own day, which was, of course, the first century before 70 A.D., and James said in James chapter 1 that of his own will, God brought us forth to be a kind of first fruits of his creation or of his creatures. So James said to his Jewish Christian friends, he and they were the first fruits. So I'm, I'm going to just go with what the Scripture says about that and say, well, the 144,000 are said to be the first fruits. Some people think that Revelation is about the end times, in which case the 144,000 wouldn't be the first fruits at all. They'd be the last fruits. But since uh, the first fruits were in the first century, I personally believe that that's the first century Christian Jews who did in fact escape before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That did happen. Uh, Eusebius, the historian who wrote in 325 A.D., mentions that the Christians in Jerusalem fled before the siege of the city, and therefore they escaped. And that's what I think is referred to in Revelation as the 144,000. All right. Our next caller is Keith calling from Orange, California. Uh, Keith, welcome to the Narrow Path. Good to hear from you. Hey, Steve. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, um, I had a question about you. Uh, someone had mentioned Greg Boyd earlier, and um, he he teaches something called the Christus Victor version of the atonement as, as opposed to the penal substitution atonement. Right, well, he does. Think, could you briefly describe each of those and then tell me which one you think has more credibility? Okay. Well, like I said, I don't agree with uh, Greg Boyd about everything. For one thing, he's an open theist, and I'm not. Right. And he has some other views I don't hold to, but I believe he's an honest and a uh, smart scholar a good biblical apologist, and although I have some, reached some different conclusions than he has about some things, I think that he's open-minded in searching the scriptures, and, and which is why he's reached some controversial conclusions. I think you have to have a bit of an open mind to do that when you're a pastor of a big Baptist church. But as far as the Christus Victor view of the atonement versus the penal substitution view, these are only two of four or five different views that are out there that Christians have held about the atonement. And by the atonement, we mean in exactly what way did Christ's death have an, an impact on sin or the sin problem? You know, when we talk about the atonement, most Christians, myself included, think in terms of penal substitution, that we, we had this problem with sin. Uh, it was a, a criminal uh, act that had penalties attached, and Christ came and he took the penalties for us, and therefore we can be justified by his death. And that's what we normally think of as the atonement. And I think there's plenty of biblical evidence that that's a right way to think. Now, the other views of the atonement explain it in different ways. There's something called the, the moral influence view that holds that Christ's death was intended to simply have an influence over us to hate sin, anything that would cause such a horrendous act as the spotless Son of God to be murdered in such a horrible way should bring revulsion in our minds and realize that sin is a horrible thing and we should want nothing to do with it. That's maybe an oversimplification of the moral influence view. The Christus Victor view is that Christ's death primarily uh, served to defeat the powers of darkness, to defeat Satan. That's Christus Victor, means Christ the victor or the conqueror. And the idea is that Christ's death was a conquest over the powers of darkness in some sense. Now, I have actually uh, made an effort to read on the Christus Victor view to understand a little more exactly how they feel this happened. And I must confess, it's not as clear to me as it could be. And I haven't read Greg on this. I know that he holds that view, but I haven't read his writings on this point. Perhaps he would make it clear where others have not. He's a good writer. But all I can say is that the emphasis of the Christus Victor view is not on there being a penalty to be paid, as if maybe God required to be paid off before he'd forgive us, but rather a victory to be accomplished over the powers of darkness and, and to conquer sin and its dominion in our lives. Now, there are other views of the atonement. Like I said, there's four or five different views of the atonement. There was a time in my life where I'd only heard one of them, and I would have thought that anyone who held a different one was some kind of a heretic. But actually, all the different views of the atonement have been held by mainstream Christians at one time or another. It's, the, the fact is, the Bible seems to support more than one view. And for that reason, I personally think that more than one view is correct. I certainly believe that Christ defeated Satan at the cross. I, we read about that in Colossians 2.15. 
It says that he disarmed the principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. That's not a problem to me. Hebrews 2.14 says that Christ, through death, destroyed him who had the power of death, which is the devil. So, again, the cross is victorious over the devil. Uh, Even the Christians defeat the devil through the blood uh, of the Lamb, which is a result of the cross and the word of their testimony, and by loving not their lives to the death. So the idea that the cross has accomplished a great victory over Satan and the powers of darkness is an unambiguous biblical truth. The thing is, what I, what I don't understand is why people line up on one side or another of this rather than saying, hey, God's a great economist. He's able to get a lot done with one action. Christ's death, I think we've got abundant scripture that suggests that Christ was a propitiation for our sins, that is a, a sacrifice of atonement for our sins, that he paid a price, he redeemed us by his blood and so forth. I mean, there's, there seems to be no, no reason to dispute this uh, unless you're trying to present a certain picture of God and that particular view of the atonement uh, interferes with your picture of God. Some people think, well, the penal substitution idea of the atonement makes God out to be someone who's reluctant to forgive unless there's some kind of a payment made, a blood payment made to him. It makes him seem kind of like, a, what should we say, reluctant, uh, unwilling to forgive, unloving, and maybe a little barbarous at that. And so some people say, that's not a view of God that I like, so I, I like this other view, the moral influence or the Christus Victor or one of the other views. That, but as near as I can tell, all the different views of the atonement exist in the church because all of them are taught in the Bible, or at least appear to be taught in the Bible. That is to say, they don't, they don't contradict each other. They're not mutually exclusive. To my mind, I have no trouble with the penal substitution view, and I'd have a real hard time uh, trying to exclude it from those verses that seem to teach it. But I don't have any problem accepting that and Christus Victor and whatever, moral influence, sure, why not? Almost any view that's out there of how Christ's death impacted our sin problem and cured it for us, I'm for it, you know, if it's got biblical support. And I think I think they all do. So I've never understood why someone has to take one view or the other. Why can't one assume that God did all these things in, in the crucifixion of Christ? Uh, C.S. Lewis, I think, said probably a very wise thing about this whole atonement thing in his book, Mere Christianity. He said that one of the things that seemed really ridiculous to him when he was an atheist and, and when he first became a Christian was the, the atonement doctrine, which, which he took to be the penal substitute. Uh, he just felt like that just made God out to be you know, less than what we should make God out to be if he requires that kind of a thing. But he said that uh, it seemed very silly to him, but he, didn't, he, he said he realized later that there were other, other explanations uh, available of how Christ's death solved the sin problem. He said he realized now that he's not sure which view is correct, but he said you don't have to know which view is correct in order to benefit from it. In other words, if, if believing on Christ to become his disciple wins for me the benefits of the atonement, that's good enough for me. What, uh, how, how that worked, how God figured that out, uh, how God understands that to have worked, that's really his problem. I'll let him worry about that. If I benefit from it, it's all good for me. And sure, we might, out of our philosophical curiosity, uh, want to know exactly how could one man's death benefit somebody else's criminal record or something like that, you know. And that is, of course, something that Christian philosophers always like to try to explain in different ways. I would say it's probably complicated and that there's these analogies given in the Bible to help us understand ways in which that could be true and in ways in which it is true. But the main things, like C.S. Lewis said, is until modern times, people didn't know why food nourished them. They didn't know about vitamins and minerals and nutrients and things. They just knew you eat and you and it gives you energy and it sustains your life. He said, we now can explain nutrition in ways that they could not. But for centuries, before anyone could explain nutrition, people were benefiting from eating food. And the same is true of Christianity. If you don't understand why the atonement works, why the death of Jesus really solved the sin problem, it doesn't mean you can't benefit from it just from the fact that God knows why it does. And I'm kind of in that place. As you know, I kind of addressed myself to some of the controversies where there's four views or three views of something, and I try to acquaint myself with them. And that's true of the atonement too, but 
but I haven't really gotten that involved emotionally with one or another view of the atonement. Because I, every view of the atonement I hear sounds like, well, yeah, the Bible teaches that too. Uh, but it doesn't require me to, to surrender another view that the Bible also teaches. They're not mutually exclusive views. They could be very well complementary. Yeah. Well, thank you. That, that was very helpful. I mean, I've, I've only just started to investigate the different views of the atonement. And that you're, you touched on something that is very true, which is that uh, at least the people that I've talked to that tend towards the Christus Victor view, they tend to it less for the benefit, as, as you're saying, which I think is an interesting way to look at it, but more about, as you mentioned, uh, the character of God, think the character of God, that they don't like this idea that, well, God is, a, is full of wrath, and he's, he's just about to bring this hammer down to, absolute, to obliterate us, uh, and Jesus has to jump in to stop his father from killing us, basically. Mm-hmm. Says, you know, okay, go ahead and, you know, direct all that anger and wrath on me. Yeah. And I'll take it. And now once I've done that, and you know, now everything's supposed to be okay between us and the Father. And it's really that picture that they don't like. Sure. And, and by the way, uh, among the people who were early in holding this view were the Anabaptists, the Mennonites and people like that who held the Christus Victor view. And it's, I'm sure it's partly because of that very thing. Mennonites see nonviolence as a very important value to God. And for God to be such a God as he requires violent death as punishment for sin, it doesn't set well with people like that many times. But I think that the way you characterized it and the way that they often do when they're rejecting the penal substitution doctrine, I don't think that that's the correct characterization of it as I have understood it. I've never understood God to be full of wrath. I think God's full of love. But I think that God, part of love is justice. I mean, you can't be a, a, a loving judge if you're an unjust judge. You can't just let people walk if they're guilty criminals because their guilt and their behavior is such that it's, it, it victimizes people and throws off the moral order. I mean, a judge is, by, by definition, obligated to uh, you know, maintain justice, which includes penalizing criminals uh, in whatever way is just. I've been in a dialogue with somebody who doesn't believe in, in, you know, God has any wrath at all. And he says, you know, the Bible says he's a God of love. You know, why would he have any judgment at all? Well, I can see that a man who sits on the bench uh, in a courtroom might be a loving father and a compassionate man. But when it comes to his obligation to enforce criminal justice, He's got to enforce criminal justice because otherwise he's not being loving to society. He's being, uns- he's being uh, you know, crooked. So I could see God is not, not at all full of wrath. And it's true. People do mischaracterize it like well, God was angry and Jesus came up and says, no, please, God, I, I have mercy on these people. Let me take it instead of them. No, the Bible says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Jesus didn't come to undo something God had in mind his wrath he came because god wanted to save us because god was on our side god is on the side of sinners and he wants them to be saved he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked should turn from their evil ways and live he says he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repent so we know that god is not full of wrath he's full of mercy and compassion but he's also a just god and there has to be some kind of just recompense for criminal behavior or else justice is not served and uh, you know, when people say, well, if the penal substitute view is true, doesn't that mean that God was you know, requiring a payment before he would forgive? You know, if he's a loving God, why wouldn't he just, for, you know, we, we're supposed to forgive people without them paying us off. You know, why wouldn't God do that? But it's different. I'm not a judge. I'm not regulating any society's criminal behavior like God is for the universe. And uh, if I were a judge, it's true. I would not make someone pay me to forgive them for something personal. But if a a case came to my bench where a man had robbed another person or damaged his property, I would say, well, uh, you're going to have to pay him this money because uh, those are the damages. There are penalties to be paid, and the judge is the one who's got to see to it that they're paid. And that's uh, he can do so even if he's ever so compassionate and loving an individual. He might be the most affectionate father in the world and the kindest neighbor. But as a judge, he's got to do what's right. And that's what Abraham said when he spoke to God. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So if God does judge sin, even if he does it very severely, 
and if he says, you know, hey, hey, Jesus, you know, if you take this in on their behalf, then that debt can be settled. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's the right way to look at it, but it's, it's characterized that way in some cases. I think that could be a way of looking at it. But in any case, I don't see any reason to say that the penal substitution view paints God in, in the colors of a wrathful, angry uh, God who had to be placated by his somewhat more generous son who liked us when God was angry at us. I mean, that's, that's just not the picture the Bible paints at all. Right, right. Well, that, that helps a whole lot. I appreciate it, Steve. Thank you. All right, Keith. Good talking to you again. God bless hey, you. God bless you. Bye now. Bye. Okay, our next call comes from Jim in Everett, Washington. Jim, welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, Steve. Uh, I've called you since I started my path with uh, Christianity. Uh -huh. You've helped me so much. And I'm going through the Bible, and I, I don't have the capability of quoting verses and all that stuff, you know. Sure. But uh, I get confused in all these laws. You know, in the Old Testament, you have, of course, the Ten Commandments, and you have the laws of Moses and all this. Right. And then you go into the New Testament, and Paul starts taking away, you know, you don't have to live by the law. You know, get away with circumcision. Do You don't need the law anymore. Right. And then, you know, Jesus has his, his uh, on the sermon, sermon on the Mount and stuff. Well, I would like to know where in the New Testament that Jesus gives the new laws. In the Old Testament, you had the laws of Moses. You had the Ten Commandments. This is what mm -hmm. the laws are going to be. Yeah. Are those laws all thrown out, like Paul says? Technically, work? technically, Jesus didn't give new laws. He gave a new commandment, which was really just an intensification of an older commandment. So, And he did not really claim that he was going to bring new laws. He said he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Yeah. So what he brought was the fulfillment of the law. And that fulfillment took the form of one new commandment. And that's found in John 13:34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another mm -hmm. as I have loved you, that you also should love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. So he says, here's the new commandment that will distinguish you as Christians. Now, loving one another was not entirely a new commandment, because way back in Leviticus, God said you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love yourself. But Jesus seemed to be intensifying the command by saying, Okay, I'm not telling you now to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You're going to have to go beyond that and love your neighbor, love each other the way I have loved you. In other words, the way you love yourself is a, you know, formerly was a good standard by which to decide whether you uh, loved your neighbor adequately. Because, as John the Baptist put it, if one of you has two coats, give one to someone who has no coat. So you're, you're treating him exactly like yourself. You each get one coat. Instead of you having two and having one, you're loving your neighbor as you love yourself. But Jesus said, now I want you to love each other the way I have loved you. Now, Jesus gave all his coats, as it were, so to speak, for his disciples. He didn't say, okay, I've got this much, you're going to have the same amount. He said, I'm going to give everything up for you. As Paul put it in Second Corinthians chapter 8, he said, uh, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he made himself poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. The idea is Christ gave up everything, including his life, for us. And Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he give up his life for his friend. So there's an intensification of the demand to love. I can understand that. What I'm getting confused is where, like, well, Paul, like he says, you know, you don't need circumcision. You don't need the offerings. You don't need all this stuff. Right. But the Old Testament says, oh, yes, you do. Right. Well, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I did come to fulfill the law. And Paul's teaching was that Christ had fulfilled the law. So if the law was fulfilled, that means that it has a different role to play than it used to. Uh, I'm looking in the Bible, and I get confused because I don't see where anybody, like Jesus told by, uh, Paul or anybody else, like, okay, tell him no more circumcision, no more this, no more that. Well, see, in the upper room, Jesus said to the disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, you have to understand what a, a covenant is. A That's covenant, a yeah, a covenant is a contract between two parties, and both parties have certain stipulations. Now, if it's a suzerainty treaty, as many people say the old covenant was, 
That's really between a high king and his conquered vassals. There were many such treaties known in the Middle East, and many people say the book of Deut Deuteronomy is written like a suzerain treaty. Uh, an example would be, for example, when Babylon conquered smaller nations like Israel or Judah or whatever. A, a sovereign a conquering king would sometimes make a contract or a covenant or a treaty with the kings that he conquered and said, okay, I will do this for you, and you will do this for me. In other words, there were stipulations and promises. Yeah. And so uh, when God made a covenant with Israel, this was not a covenant between equals. For example, David and Jonathan made a covenant with each other. That's, that's a covenant between equals. Yeah. But, but God was not equal to Israel. God was the great king, and Israel was the, the vassal under the great king. And so God made promises and made stipulations. And those stipulations belong to the covenant. But the Bible says that the new covenant has made the old covenant obsolete. It says that in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. So sort of like my question, because a caller earlier sort of touched on it, but these uh, verses, these writings and everything in the Old Testament, what has that got to do with us now? Well, we still abide by, you, know, you can't pick and choose. You know, just, no, you well, no, no, you don't pick and choose. No. Like you told me before, I'm too regimented. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, let's look at, let, okay, let's consider what's in the Old Testament. We have historical narrative, primarily. The majority of the Old Testament is stories that are told yeah, about things that happen. And all that. Okay. Well, there's the law in there, which takes up about two or three books of the Old Testament. The actual laws, you know, the legislation given by Moses. That's found in half of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, portions of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy. So you've got approximately three books of law in the Old Testament out of 39 books. Now, the rest of the books are historical narrative, or like the Psalms, examples of prayers and worship, or like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they're books of wisdom, or like the, books, uh, the other books are books of prophecy. Now, if Paul says we're not under the law, this doesn't mean that the Old Testament somehow is thrown out, because Paul preached continually from the Old Testament, as did Jesus. But what he's saying is the laws that were attached to the Old Covenant, the, the Sinaitic legislation that God made, mm -hmm. those things belonged to a covenant that God established with Israel when they came out of Egypt. But he promised to make a new covenant with them, and this he has done. And the new covenant has different stipulations. So when we look at the laws of the Old Covenant, we have to realize that those laws are associated with a covenant that is now defunct. However, Jesus made a new covenant with his people, and there, whatever Christ has commanded us to do, that becomes the stipulations of the new covenant. And so that would be the way I would uh, try to clarify that. I didn't know we were running out of time so quickly. That hour just got away from us, but I hope that helps. The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. We pay for the time on the radio stations. Nobody here gets paid. I don't get paid. No one gets paid. But we buy the time. We pay the radio stations so that we can bring you this program. That money comes from listeners like yourself. If you'd like to help us pay the bills, you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. Or you can send us a, a letter at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Be sure you visit the website, though, thenarrowpath.com, and join us again tomorrow, and we'll continue our discussion. God bless.